Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Tom Segev, an Israeli journalist and historian. He's the author of numerous books on Israel and the Holocaust, including The Seventh Million, The Israelis and the Holocaust, Elvis in Jerusalem, Post-Zionism and the Americanization of Israel, 1967, Israel, the War and the Year that Transformed the Middle East, and most recently, Simon Weisenthal, The Life and Legends. Segev gave a talk titled Israel and the Holocaust on April 27, 2014, as the 2014 Singer Family Lecturer presented by the Judaic Studies Program at the University of Oregon. Thank you, Tom, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, give us a brief history lesson. Help our viewers remember how the state of Israel came into existence. Oh, that's a very brief uh, <laughs> history. Actually, one of the questions which I took up yesterday in, in the lecture was, I, I mentioned the question, to what extent did the Holocaust mm -hmm. contribute to the establishment of Israel? That is a perfectly uh, good way to answer my question. Because um, uh, some people believe that Israel is actually the result of the Holocaust, and I don't think that's true. I think that Israel is actually the result of uh, at least 30 years of uh, very systematic uh, uh, Zionist work. Um, of course, Israel represents a, uh, a dream that is about 2,000 years old. The dream of return is part of the Jewish religion and has always been part of religion. But uh, uh, the Zionist uh, enterprise uh, took f from 1918 to uh, 1948. And I think that uh, the Holocaust um, actually harmed the Zionist dream uh, a great deal. Zionism predicted the Holocaust, but in the moment of truth, it was helpless to do anything for the Jews. So that was a very uh, tragic uh, point for uh, the Zionist ideology. And also, th the state of Israel was meant to take in Jews from Europe. And now they were all gone. And so the Zionist movement had to discover the uh, Jews in the Arab countries. So it was a very different, it became a very different country from what the uh, founding fathers and mothers of, of Zionism had, had, had thought. And, and so if anything, then, then the Holocaust was actually very harmful to the Zionist dream and did not lead to the establishment of Israel. Today is Yom HaShoah, the Israeli Day of Holocaust Remembrance. How did the Jews who were living in Palestine respond to the plight of the European Jews during the Holocaust, during World War II? Not the way uh, I, as an historian, would like to find. Um, for a short while, they feared that the German army might invade Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, like in 1942, the battles of uh, uh, North Africa, but then they were held back and the prevailing feeling for Jews in Palestine was we were saved. Uh, very so if, if you look at the, at the Hebrew press in, uh, that, that was printed in Palestine, you see that the major story uh, is very rarely the Holocaust. The major story was the war. The assumption mm -hmm. was that uh, you would do something for the Jews of Europe by defeating the uh, the Germans, and uh, life went on, and that is uh, very strange. Um, if you look at the newspapers today, somewhere among the, the inside pages of, of a newspaper, you can find a little item saying that um, the Germans are pushing Jews into gas chambers, and that happens next to a little town in Poland called Oswiecki, which is Auschwitz. So you say, this is worth more than a tiny little item. Now, after the war, uh, editors were asked about it, and uh, they said, A, that they couldn't internalize the horrors of, uh, mm -hmm. of the Holocaust. B, they couldn't verify them. Three, they didn't want to cause unnecessary panic. Um, all kinds of, of excuses. They missed the greatest story of the 20th century, not alone. By the way, the New York Times also missed that story. 
So, um, and, and, and Holocaust survivors uh, very often asked the people they met in Israel, what did you do for us? Why didn't you do more? Basically, they couldn't do more. I mean, there are all kinds of, of uh, questions and question marks hanging over specific rescue schemes, but uh, basically, uh, the Jews in Palestine were unable to do much for, for the Jews in Europe. You've just mentioned the survivors who went to Palestine. Um, how were they received? They were not received very well. They brought with them uh, the weakness, the Jewish weakness, which the uh, pioneers of in, in, in Palestine wanted to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Um, they were generally considered to be evil people because the assumption was that if you survived the Holocaust, you survived on the expense of somebody else. Hmm. Um, hmm. Very rarely uh, did they find sympathetic ears for their story. Nobody cared for their, for their stories. Um, they were very often referred to in popular slang as soap, sabon. Hmm. Um, based on the erroneous assumption that the Nazis were manufacturing, manufacturing soap from the bodies of, of the Jews. So these Holocaust survivors really went through a second trauma. And um, very soon, the Holocaust generally became a taboo. Very little was said about it because everybody agreed, let's, let's not talk about the Holocaust. Best thing not to talk about it. So uh, parents wouldn't tell their children about it, and children wouldn't dare to ask. And um, that lasted until the early 60s. It's the Eichmann trial is important. The Eichmann reasons. trial. Would you tell us a little bit about that? How did the Eichmann trial change the way uh, Israelis thought? The Eichmann trial actually um, became a kind of therapy for, for the entire uh, nation, because for the first time, uh, Israel really confronted the Holocaust in, in detail. For the first time, Holocaust survivors were needed. And um, until then, more was said about Jewish collaboration with the Nazis than about um, the, 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 the massacre of, of, of the Jews. Uh, more was said about the, the very um, few incidents of rebellion against the Nazis than about the story itself. So the Eichmann trial really confronted the entire nation with, with, with the Holocaust. And um, beginning with the Eichmann trial, the Holocaust gradually became what it is today, namely a very central element of the Israeli identity. So today, um, when you talk to young Israelis and say, <coughs> what What's the relevance of the Holocaust for you? How does it bear on your lives? What, what kind of answers do young Israelis give? Eight out of 10 Israeli high school kids say, yes, I am a Holocaust survivor. Hmm. Why are you a Holocaust survivor? You were born in Israel. Your father was born in Israel. Your grandfather was born in Morocco. Why are you a Holocaust survivor? Hmm. There is not a single day without some reference to the Holocaust in the Israeli media. The Holocaust is always present in almost every discussion we have, especially if that's say, as we have many moral discussions, basic discussions, any, any, any um, argument about um, um, basic values, who are we, whom do we want to be, the Holocaust is always there. And the Holocaust also serves always as, as an argument for almost everything. So if uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to talk about Iran, he will talk about the Holocaust. If uh, um, people who object to the uh, oppression of the Palestinians in the, in the occupied territories, they will talk about the Holocaust. So the Holocaust is always present in our lives. There have been a dizzying number of recent developments impacting the Arab-Israeli conflict, not only continuing unrest in Egypt, the Syrian crisis, American nuclear negotiations with Iran, but also more recently, the public reconciliation between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. And last week, Mahmoud Abbas's public acknowledgement of the Holocaust as the most heinous crime in modern history. Do any of these 
events change your view, affect your view of the possibility of a, rec a resolution to the conflict? Does it make you more hopeful? If you, if you had asked me uh, 40 years ago, I would tell you uh, no doubt that by 2014 we will have uh, long-lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians, but I don't believe that anymore. And to me that is a strange experience because for the first time I am in agreement with the majority of, of, uh, of other Israelis uh, who have given up a hope that um, peace is possible. Not that they don't long for peace, pray for peace, are willing to pay something for peace, but uh, most Israelis don't believe that uh, peace is possible and most Palestinians don't believe that peace is possible. And um, because uh, the gap is, is, is too deep. I sometimes um, have a terrible thought that maybe both Israelis and Palestinians haven't su have, have, have not suffered enough uh, to be able to make the, the necessary concessions. Uh, so we go on uh, living with that conflict, managing it somehow, usually badly. And um, once in a while, some preacher type uh, statesman like uh, your Secretary of State uh, uh, comes along and uh, tries to make peace. And um, he has to realize after a while that it can't work. He of course realized that last week, right? He so. realized it last week. So um, if uh, President, uh, Palestinian President Abbas says uh, something uh, about the Holocaust to the New York Times, it really doesn't mean much. I think that uh, the Arab world in general regards the Holocaust as a product of Zionist propaganda, which is very unfortunate because you can't understand Israel without understanding the role of the Holocaust in, in our collective identity. And unless you understand your enemy, you also can't make peace with your enemy. And so I always thought that this is uh, really unfortunate. And, um, but I think that uh, Abbas now must have some smart advisors who tell him last week he, he uh, congratulated Israelis for Passover in Hebrew on Israeli television. Um, but we still are very, very far away from any possibility of a compromise. So I know that you've spoken about how when people in Israel and in, in Palis and the Palestinians are asked about what would a solution look like, there's general agreement, two states. But you also have said, as you just did, that the possibility does not seem likely. Explain, a, li explain a little bit more why if people can agree on what it would look like, why compromise is not possible? Why people like you who have... I hate to correct my, my interviewer. Oh, but, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> but um, not everybody agrees on the two-state solution. Mm -hmm. The Hamas doesn't agree on, on the two-state solution. Um, and a number of significant cabinet ministers in, in the government of Netanyahu don't agree. So the majority of the population? The majority of the population uh, might agree if uh, a statesman mm -hmm. like Menachem Begin would go for it, not mm -hmm. if a statesman like uh, B Benjamin Netanyahu goes for it. And, and so I think that even the two-state solution which, by the way, began as a radical left leftist uh, idea. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Netanyahu took this very smart move and said, you know what? I, I embrace the idea. OK, I'm also for a two-state solution. Go ahead. So I look nice on, on the American media. And I can tell the whole world, what can I do more than a two-state solution? But uh, he doesn't really mean it, because ideologically, he's against it. And politically, he doesn't have the power to do it. So it's another fiction. We are really living this conflict from fiction to fiction. I, I remind you of, of President uh, Bush's uh, uh, roadmap. Mm -hmm. you know? There was a certain date, 
So I, I was always wondering, it was Wednesday, but uh, is it before lunch or after lunch that we will end the 100 years conflict? So there's a whole lot, whole lot of, of naive um, goodwill involved uh, and, and, and a lot of, of cynical politics. Mm -hmm. And basically, the positions are very, very far away. This is, and, and they have changed very little in the last 100 years. Why is that? What, what is it that gives this these positions such resilience? You said they, they haven't suffered enough. Say a little bit more about what you mean. First of all, they suffered a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, both Israelis and Palestinians suffered a lot, um, killing each other and and um, and. Uh, but but um, I think that this uh, is not a conflict uh, about land. It is not a conflict about security, it's not about water, it's not about borders. It's really about identity. Mm -hmm. You have two nations here which define their identity by the land, all of it. So every compromise would mean giving up part of your identity. And that is apparently very, very difficult to do, especially for two nations which are still um, defining their identity and uh, asking themselves who they are and, and, and what it is they want to be. And um, also, it's the holy land. It's a crazy land. It's, it's, uh, we are talking here about irrational things. Why, why um, y you mentioned the book I wrote about uh, 1967, and I, I was able to take a look at the minutes of the cabinet meeting, the Israeli cabinet meeting, in which they decided to occupy East Jerusalem in 1967, the Six Day War. So these are ministers who are sitting there, and they have to take this decision. The decision is to take the old city, which means taking the holy places of the entire Christian world, the entire Muslim world. And there are no position papers, there are no alternatives, there are no experts, there are no legal experts. When you and I buy a new apartment, we go to ask a lawyer, but there is no, nobody tells them what it means. And nobody asks, why is it good for us to take East Jerusalem? Because it's natural. Mm -hmm. why, why should we ask that even? Mm -hmm. And that's the way the conflict is also being uh, conducted from, from the Palestinian side. They lost two generations, maybe three generations, over the question, who will control the Temple Mount? Why is that worth so many lives? And it's an irrational thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, lots and lots of think tanks all over the world who make models and, and, and schemes and, and know and conflict resolution and it doesn't work for us. We, we, are, we are crazy people, both Israelis and Palestinians in a crazy country. And so that's very, very tragic. Given that tragic vision, what kind of steps do you think the Israeli government can and should take if solving the conflict is not going to happen. I think that uh, if you look back at uh, the last uh, 45 years or so since 1967, we have gained absolutely nothing from the occupied territories. We have only lost. They were very, very harmful for our uh, routine and for our future. And I think that um, in the near future, which is still very far away, we should go for a two-state solution. And eventually, maybe a hundred years from now or something, I don't know what, um, I would say that uh, Israelis and Palestinians should uh, live together. And, but I can't really think of it as, as, as a realistic possibility now. I know that some intellectuals in, in New York are writing articles about the two-state solution, the, 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 the binational solution, which is a very old idea, actually comes from the 20s. Um, I don't know that I want to live in a country with, uh, with um, that, that would uh, f condone the, the basic values of, of a Muslim country. Uh, these are not my values. Um, 
and my values are not their values. So it would still be very, very difficult. But maybe after a hundred years of peace, we will all of a sudden find out what what are these borders for. But the first thing I think for in in the interest of Israel, I don't really care for the interest of the Palestinians. But in the interest of Israel, Israel should remain a Jewish and democratic country. And the only way to assure that would be a two-state solution. We should get out of the occupied territories. We should uh, dismantle as many um, settlements as possible. Some can't be undone anymore. The geopolitical situation has changed. The Palestinians keep talking about 1967. 1967 is a fiction. It doesn't exist anymore. But some settlements can be uh, dismantled. Some land swap uh, is, is possible. But you need a different ideology, basically. And um, make no mistake, Benjamin Netanyahu represents the majority of Israelis. He is a true representative of Israel. This is the way most Israelis think. Some people I know in, 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 in other countries uh, think if you could only get rid of that horrible man, but that's not the case. He is a democratically elected statesman, and he enjoys a very large majority among the, the, the population. So this is the true voice of Israel right now. You mentioned um, your sense and uh, many Israeli sense of their, the identity of their nation as a democratic Jewish nation. Say a little bit more about that idea is is that an idea that I mean you just said because you believe that mm -hmm. you think that these changes have to happen there's some sense in which there's there's a problem with that concept yes a big problem but it's a big that. problem because uh, you you might argue that uh, is Israel can be either Jewish or democratic but not both and um, that would be something you would say in the name of 20% of Israelis who are Arabs. Many people don't know that, but uh, one in every five Israeli citizens, not the, popul the Palestinian population, are, are Arabs. And many of them say, well, these are not my, my symbols. This is not my flag. This is not my national anthem. This is not my country. This is, um, on the other hand, um, many countries have large national minorities and um, grant them equal rights and sometimes cultural autonomy. And um, I also think that most Israeli Arabs want nothing more than to be equal citizens in Israel, and they are not at, at, at this point. So um, I think that um, before we argue about symbols, we can uh, still argue about uh, granting equal rights to all Israeli Arabs. Again, I'm not talking about the the Palestinians in the, the occupied territories. I'm talking about Israeli Arab. There is a lot that can be done to make Israel more democratic. Israel actually becomes less and less democratic uh, in, in recent years. And I think that this is uh, perhaps the major danger for, for Israel's um, future. Not the war and not Iran, but really um, our own uh, neglect of, of, of the democracy. Democracy is something that needs to be maintained, like, like a car, and, and, and we don't do that uh, well enough. You've, you've mentioned in interviews uh, uh, something that's happening, obviously, in the United States as well. It's happening all over the world, the rise of religious extremism, and along with religious extremism, religious hatred. You've, you've spoken about how this is a relatively new phenomenon in, in uh, Israel of religious hatred for the... Not only religious hatred, but uh, hatred in general, mm -hmm. hatred of, of others. This has become uh, a legitimate thing. I, th I, I would assume that uh, there were always people who, who hated and there was always hatred around, but uh, we never admitted it. It, it's, it has become legitimate, uh, and not all of that hatred is, is, uh, is soccer field uh, hatred, but... but uh, Israel is becoming uh, more uh, racist and more uh, and less democratic by a whole series of 
uh, legal actions t uh, taken by by uh, by the Israeli Knesset, and that's uh, I think uh, very very dangerous. We've got about two minutes left. I was wondering uh, if you're working on any new projects, and if you are, would you tell us about that? I am uh, writing a biography of David Ben-Gurion right now. I've been writing about him in all my books, and so I decided that it's really time to sum it up. And uh, the major difficulty is to find my way through the um, the um, the myth of of David Ben-Gurion. I, I think that he was a fascinating man and great statesman and uh, and everything but uh, much of what I find is is very different from uh, what uh, the the Israeli mythology made him to be and so that's a very very fascinating I think for of, of all, the, all the books I wrote that's probably the, the most difficult one to to write because difficult because why because for you to let go of these myths yes it's I, I have great difficulty to remind myself that I need to be fair to you and that's I think um, a great difficulty because I'm I'm basically very critical of many things he he, he did and I always have to remind myself uh, to think the way he thought and to see things he saw the the, the, the way he saw and 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 be fair to uh, to the to the to the man I'm writing about. He's, he's not here anymore to defend himself. So I keep reminding myself: uh, stop doing that. Be nice to him. Be fair to him. Not nice, but really be fair to him. Well, thank you so much for taking the time with, uh, to speak with thank us you. today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. I've been speaking with Tom Segev, an Israeli journalist and historian. He gave a talk titled Israel and the Holocaust on April 27, 2014, as the 2014 Singer Family Lecturer presented by the Judaic Studies Program at the University of Oregon. Um, I'm Paul Pepys. Thanks so much for watching. Mm -hmm.